I'm Andy Howell here with the Science vs. Cinema short. I just saw the movie Passengers. We boarded the Avalon with a destination. 120 year cybernation means we'll wake up in a new century on a new planet. In reality, if you try to accelerate something to near the speed of light, even half the speed of light, it requires unbelievable amounts of energy. And uh, that's just to get something really tiny going. The more mass you put, the more energy you need. And it gets to be super expensive. There is just no way you have all this stuff like on a luxury liner, just on an interstellar voyage. Do you know what's going on? Okay, the normal thing is I'll give people a pass for the premise of their movie. And in this case, it's that yes, you have a luxury liner traveling between stars. So they have some fusion on board. It wouldn't really be enough, but fine, let's give them that. There's this zero gravity swimming scene. Jennifer Lawrence is swimming in the pool and then the gravity cuts out. Warning, gravity failure. You get this massive ball of water that floats up in the air, which is a really cool visual. I like the general idea. But the problem is gravity is generated by the ship spinning. If you're gonna just all of a sudden stop a ship that massive from spinning, there's so much inertia, no way. It just cuts out right when the rider wants it to. It just doesn't work that way. That's just crazy. Now you've already gone through the lengths to establish the spinning spaceship, which is pretty cool. That's how we would generate gravity. But then you gotta follow through with that, but they don't. So you might as well just say, hey, in the future, they've got some other kind of mechanism for making gravity. There's a scene where they go slingshotting around the star. It makes no sense. How long ago did we leave Earth? Approximately 30 years ago. They've been going for 30 years. They're only going half the speed of light. So they've only gone like 15 light years. But the actual star is much farther away than where they are in the journey. Besides, 15 light years away from the sun, there's not a high enough density of stars for you to go around one and then go to another. That just takes you out of the way. It doesn't even work. But anyway, slingshotting around a star is not a thing. Okay, slingshotting around a planet is. So when we send a space probe, we might get a gravity assist by say going around Jupiter to go farther out in the solar system. And that's because we're really using the angular momentum of Jupiter. Jupiter's orbiting the sun and you're using that motion to uh, give a little to the spacecraft to make it go even faster. It doesn't work that way with stars. And you can't take a ship that massive, going half the speed of light, and actually slow it down appreciably by just putting it next to a star. Another problem, they run into some asteroids to start the whole thing. First of all, those are movie asteroids. You're not actually going into an asteroid field. They'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? Real asteroids, not like that. There's no dense field of asteroids. On a real asteroid, you could stand on one, you couldn't even see another asteroid, okay? But fine. We'll give them some crazy asteroids in the path, which also the odds of that are insanely low. And like they wouldn't have this route mapped out by now or have some way to sense that there's some asteroids coming on the horizon. And another thing, I know they've got some shields, but if you run into asteroids at half the speed of light, ain't no just a hole going in the spaceship. Okay, that whole spaceship is incinerated. Makes no sense. Come up with another problem. Just, hey, some circuits failed, whatever. That's another thing. I don't like it when they act like, oh, this just can't possibly fail. They've got like spares for everything on the ship, but then they just think the life pods are so infallible. They don't have backups or a way to put you in the coma again. I mean, they got every kind of liquor you can imagine on the damn thing and all these swimming pools and whatever. How about just a coma pod? That's like, see what seemed like the most important thing. You two look fine this evening. We're on a date. Very nice. It's crazy to me how everything on this ship is automated, except the tech support. The fact that the ship ran into asteroids, you would think there would be some diagnostic that would tell you, you know what, there's a giant hole in the ship and the fusion reactor is going nuts. There's something else going on here. But it takes a massive investigation over years to figure this out. Come on. The whole section's closed off, something's wrong. We're looking for wrong. Try to open it. I don't accept that it's almost impossible to tell that the problem is that there's a giant hole in the ship until you open a door and then there's a vacuum of space. That makes no sense at all. Another central obstacle in the plot is the crew is locked away behind a vault door. It's all designed to keep us out. There has to be a way. Why would you do that? You'd have to have some mechanism for people getting in and out. What if that lock got 
stuck or something or somebody woke up early. And meanwhile, the computer understands a million things about, I don't know what, breakfast cereal or whatever, but you try to tell it, hey, I've woken up on this ship and it doesn't know anything. I'm the only one awake. I don't understand. Again, things magically work when the writers want it to work, and then they don't work when the writers don't want it to work. I woke up too soon. They attempt to introduce some truth when they uh, have Chris Pratt trying to send a message back to Earth. He sits down, records his message, hits send, and then the computer tells him, oh, well, it'll take 19 years to get back to Earth and 30-something years to get back the other way. Approximately 30 years. Come on, he would know that. He would know he's light years away and you can't communicate. You, ah, this is so obvious. It's just insane. Just like respect the audience here, people. Don't uh, just do some little thing for a little joke that undermines the plausibility for people who are smart enough to understand what's going on. This wasn't an accident. There's something they didn't tell us. Here we go. There's a reason we woke up early. Passengers does not get a pass. It should be called failures. Every problem that comes up is just written perfectly as the writer would write it, and nothing about it seems authentic or real. And so as a result, there are no real stakes. You don't feel like you're watching a real thing. You can't suspend disbelief. This is what the worst episodes of Star Trek have, where somebody has to narrate you what the stakes are. They're transforming the deflector dish into an interplexing beacon. Interplexing? It's a subspace transmitter. If they activate the beacon, they'll be able to establish a link with the Borg living in this century. Oh, we've got to pull this switch, and then we've got to get over there. Then we must destroy the deflector dish before they can activate the beacon. And if we don't do it in five minutes, everything's going to explode. We can't get to deflector control or a shuttlecraft. None of that feels real because they just made that up. This ship is going to go. I have to do this. No! You die, I die! And that's exactly how I feel about passengers. All of the obstacles feel just made up. And even the relationship stuff feels like it happens when it needs to happen. What do we do now? The asteroids magically woke up the one mechanic who can save the ship. Yeah, I can't give it a pass. I think maybe it gets like a D. It gets a little bit of credit for some nice visuals, but uh, it really didn't do its homework. 